completely don't remember what I was doing. Oh god, my brain is... soup. I'm not even on medication anymore. Ugh. Which is probably a mistake. I'm going to be in pain. But I'm sick of being stupid. I know vaguely what I'm doing. Something tells me that stream just shat itself. Yeah, I might be a little low energy because I'm tired and... I'm tired and worried. Um, and gods, I hope their eyes are... I hope their skin is not where their eyes are, so help me. But, either way, there's not really a lot I can do. There hasn't been for almost a year at this point. I just have to hope. They know my sentiment. But that's all I'll say in the realm where people can hear me. Those already who know do not need it heard said. You know, you already know. Um, that being said, fuck Vladimir Putin. those Cold War ghosts that continue to fuck everything up. If anyone wanted to know where I stand on that, there you go. Old men should let old wars die. If they had, maybe my life personally would have been different, but we use the tools we have, and we don't use what we don't. That's that. What else is there to say? What else is there to do? And I hope those of you that I care about, and you know that I care about you, I hope you guys are not anywhere dangerous if you can help it, and if you are, May the fortunes and fates be with you, and I wish I could do more, but I cannot. I never could. But 
you guys are not here to listen to me speak of things over which we have no control. And so I will not speak at length. But if anyone was wondering, it's, it's on the old mind. just hope their skin is not where their eyes are right now. I really do. But I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. But, yeah, I should start looking for a background to do the scary stories with, because this certainly is not what I'm on here to talk about at all. Um, I just hope that it's... I just hope that I'm understood. the hell? Why are you making noise? Uh, let's see. Um. Boy, I'd love to be able to focus. That'd be good. This will do for now. We can modify it as we need to. Nah, I'm not satisfied with that. Here, I'll at least let you guys watch my indecisive process here. It's not like I have any, um, uh, how to say. I don't have any porn wallpapers. That doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not judging if you do, it just personally, for me, it doesn't make sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, dude. I'm sorry I haven't been on as much. I've been sick. I'm still not super great at the moment, but I'm... I'm trying my best. That's all I can do. Uh, but, you're, you're here, which makes my life easy, because I could just pick the Texan book, and it will be fine. I think. Yeah, this will do. Or even this. How you doing, dude? Sorry for the low energy, I'm... Well, you know. Right. I gotta... I gotta find Texas. How dare I? <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you. Oh, yeah, you enjoy the new emotes, you finally have access to coffee. I don't remember if this was something you already knew or had. Am I even showing the screen? Yes, I am. Okay. God damn it. That garage with the car scared the shit out of me, and I thought I was playing that fucking game again, because I was just like, I don't remember that being there. Observation duty? Ah, yeah. 
Yeah, no. I, uh... <laughs> not today. <laughs> not... Not today. I don't know how long I'll be on here for, but I'll try to do it for as long as I can. <sighs> what is this? Era. Alright. So the first one on the docket. Oh. Sadly, you need to decrease your coffee intake according to the doctor, which is like asking you to stop breathing. Oh. My deepest condolences. Is it like a caffeine thing? Do you think you could do decaf? Oof, I remember that feeling when they uh, told me I had celiacs. I was just like, there's no fucking way you're making me give up pizza. This is unconstitutional. But I found ways around it eventually. Actually, I had pizza last night. Your heart can't take it thing, which is total BS. Oof. Yo, sassy, what's up? I mean, you're pretty tough. I I mean, I ain't, I ain't no doctor. I ain't gonna tell you what to do. All, all that I ask is that you, you take care of yourself as as much as you can. Well, yeah. Okay. doing good just existing for once i read that as a exercising for once and i was about to call bullshit i was just like you hike don't give me that uh all right let's do the warning from wichita falls this is in the texan book because of course it is restroom quick so you'll be back in a sec not a problem i can wait till you're back i've already been wasting time for 13 minutes what's two more don't it don't matter i don't mind shooting the shit with chat i got my comfortable blanket i'm not Currently on meds, I let those expire. Not expire. Um, wear off. But I am still a little sleepy and residually stupid from them. So if I'm dumber than usual, I mean. I don't. I don't think me being dumber than usual is going to bother anyone with you. I think that's kind of why you're here. I feel like the idiocy is part of the appeal. But yeah, I, I sincerely hope y'all are being safe and taking care of yourself and not reading as much of the news as you know that I am. Wish I could stop, but I'm just... So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because I'm restless if I don't read it. And I'm restless when I read it. It's just, it's awful. <laughs> Oh, 
Why did it have to be? Why did it have to be there? It is what it is. And hopefully, hopefully things don't get much worse for any of us. But I guess that's the most you can really, I don't know, reasonably ask for. I'm going to start reading. This is called The Warning from Wichita Falls. When I was a boy, I lived in town north of Mexico City, which was watched over and guided by the good Padre Simon. We were poor then, but we were proud. We worked hard in the potato fields every day and gave freely to the church. And Padre Simon gave back to us much wealth, though... It was wealth of kindness and laughter and sympathy and good counsel rather than money. All this changed one day when a man named Don Carlo came from Mexico City to live in our town. He was a wealthy, ambitious man who wanted to run everything. Soon he owned both stores in town, and the smithy and the sawmill to boot. But he could not own the church, no matter how hard he tried to bribe Padre Simon. So Don Carlo started telling everyone how we could be rich if we stopped giving money to the church and stood together. He said terrible things about Padre Simon. That he was fat and lazy. He took all the money we gave to the church and buried it in jars under the altar. And what did the Padre give his workers in return? A prayer or two? A message on Sunday? He was cheating the people and keeping them from enjoying their hard-earned pay. My parents, they were very upset with Don Carlo. They did not like to hear him speak against the good Padre and forbade me to listen to him. Many of the other field workers listened to the wealthy man from the city who owned so much property and had so much power. They began to grumble whenever the good Padre rode to his potato fields on his donkey. They no longer went to confession or laughed with him after services on Sunday. There was even talk of raiding the church to dig up the money that Padre had supposedly buried under the altar. <laughs> you're, I'm back in your southern. <laughs> yeah. Here's a here's a sh a quick recap. Uh, family not have lots of money. Give money to. Uh, Padre Simon. Padre Simon, fun to be around. Laughs. Gives people prayers. Rich dude enters town. Buys everything. Can't buy the church. Gets mad. Starts telling people lies about the dude who runs the church. People start to believe the lies and try to get back the money that they think he stole from them, even though there's no evidence of any of that. Uh... Narrator does not agree with the slander so far. My father was alarmed when he heard this rumor one steamy hot morning. As we stood outside church, reluctant to go inside the muggy building until the last possible moment. You should write the synopsis on the back of books. <laughs> Okay, 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 pause, pause, pause. So, because this is digging up something old. When I first joined Twitch in 2017 up until early 2018, I joined Twitch to make friends, actually, to kind of get away from Mooney and all that. I've told this story many a time. One of the things that I did to make people like me was people would, like, go away to do something and then come back into chat and be like, I'm back, what did I miss? 
and my gimmick was I would summarize what happened technically but do it in a humorous way such that it seemed much more ridiculous than it was. Um, and this got people to like me. And so I used to be able to do it like in a joking way and like make it stupid and funny. Somewhere along the line, I feel like I lost the ability to do that. I guess the selection pressure on it relaxed. And so I don't need to do it anymore, so I don't. Because that pressure's not there, I don't do it organically. I might start, like, Chaos, if we ever get that, um, D&D &D campaign off the ground, I can try to reboot, like, my bad synopsis joke again to, like, recap sessions and stuff like that. That'd be cool. That sold you? Oh, sweet. Yeah, you know what? Chat, hold me to that. I'm gonna- I'm gonna challenge myself to keep doing that. Tenshi used to be the master at that. Is. Is the master at that. Um... Where he could just make up a crazy-ass story off of, like, the smallest pieces of nothing. And they would be so good. Like... Oh my god, he did it once for, like, grains of sand. And a... And a... Plant related to garlic. And I remember I was rolling on the floor laughing and there's no way I'd be able to replicate it. God, he was so good. I miss him so much. I... <laughs> I don't miss him less over time. If anything, I just miss him more. I feel like it takes a certain level of improv. Oh, for sure. For sure. There's... Honey, even if you gave me a script, I couldn't keep on to it. <laughs> I... I... I've gotten too spunky in my old age. Alright, sorry. A commercial over, and now for the feature presentation. <laughs> Sorry about that, chat. My father was alarmed when he heard this rumor one steamy hot morning as we stood outside the church, reluctant to go in the muggy building until the last possible moment. We must warn Padre Simon, he said. He could be injured or killed if a mob attacks the church. At that moment, Padre Simon came down the steps to greet his parishioners. Parishioners? Parishioners? Par parish parish owners oh my god i didn't realize i don't know how to say that word parishioners per 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 fuck parish people i'm gonna just call them parish people he was a small, round man, wearing dusty, dark robes. He had a florid face that beamed with delight whenever he saw a member of his parish. His face was beaming now as the men and women around us straightened up and stared at him with unfriendly eyes. My father hurried forward to speak with the padre and tried to deflect some of the unspoken anger directed at him. Above us, a dark cloud passed over the sun, blotting out the bright light. They seemed ominous to me, as if the cloud represented the dark feelings of the men and women around us. I felt a sudden puff of cold air against my cheek, and then the tossing, 
black clouds in the sky dropped a swirling finger toward the land, not far from the place we were standing. It was a tornado. A twister whirled fiercely, turning dark with debris and dust. The roar and wailing and clattering noise it made was tremendous, and around us the workers started to panic. Some of the men and women fell to their knees to pray, while they shouted and ran in all directions. My mother came, ran up to me, and snatched me into her arms. Hurry, Pedro, we must run, she cried, twisting her head this way and that as she tried to see where my father had gone. And then, above the roaring of the storm and the screaming of the people, rose the voice of Padre Simon. Just give them a normal voice. Peace, my people. I will deal with this, he cried. Padre Simon stu strode out of the church gate and pushed forward through the mass of wind toward the whirling, shrieking menace, waving his hands and praying aloud. As we watched, Padre Simon's hand seemed to cut through the spiraling fury in front of us, pushing it back and then back again. It grew smaller and smaller shrinking in on itself as Padre Simon strode toward it, and suddenly it was gone, leaving only a white streak of smoke where it had been, and the black roiling cloud fled south, away from the good Padre. For a moment we were stunned by the suddenness of our salvation, then the people shouted in amazement, and everyone ran to the good Padre to pound him on the back and kiss the ring on his hand and kneel at his feet. He'd saved us from the tornado. Many of the workers who'd murmured and fought against the Padre were in tears, so ashamed they were for doubting him. But they doubted no more. Later we learned that the tornado had struck the grand house of Don Carlo, carrying him away and leaving him bruised and bleeding in the plaza. After that he went back to Mexico City and never returned. And everyone who worked in the potato fields grew happy again and loved the good Padre who had walked right up to a tornado to protect his people. The good Padre lived for many years among us, giving us counsel and guiding, guiding us along the paths of righteousness. Knowing it was the greatest wish of my parents that I be educated, he helped provide the money necessary to get me started in boarding school and encouraged me in my studies. Padre Simon died when I was fifteen. It was a sad day for our community. Wished he'd lived long enough to see me win a scholarship to a university in Texas. He would have been so proud. Wait, you're not in Texas? Where the fuck are you? But it was not to be. In honor of my parents and the good Padre, who so digital did did. diligently guided my footsteps as I grew up. I worked my way through college and then law school. I set up a practice in Wichita Falls, married the daughter of my partner. What? Oh, I read that wrong. Married the daughter of my business partner and settled down on a small ranch outside of town. Kept a few cows, horses, and chickens, and I was very happy puttering them out of my house and barn after a hard day at the courthouse. I often spoke about the good Padre to my bride until she felt like she knew him too. She particularly loved to listen to the story of Padre Simon and the tornado. I heard her repeating it in the bedtime tale to the little daughter a few months after her birth. It made me smile to think Padre Simon lived in lived on in our house. I was still smiling when I dropped off to sleep beside my wife that night, but I wasn't smiling when I jerked out of a deep sleep in the middle of the night by somebody fiercely shaking me by my shoulders. What? What is it? I demanded sleepily, crying my eyes open to glare at the intruder. 
find myself staring in the face of Padre Simon. He was the same little round priest with the dusty robes and beaming florid face, though he wasn't smiling at the moment. Get up now, Pedro, and take your family to the root cellar, Padre Simon ordered, as soon as he saw that I'd awoken. Beside me, my wife sat up with a gasp, staring at Padre. Go, right now, Padre Simon shouted at us, and then vanished completely. We leapt out of bed, my wife snatching our daughter from a cradle and sped down the stairs and out the front door. It was inky black outside, but I could hear a familiar roaring, shrieking sound not far away. We were met by such a gust of wind that we were nearly blown back inside. My little daughter wailed in fear. I grabbed hold of my women, leaned forward and pushed against the wind until we made it round the side of our house. After two tries, I managed to lift the door to the root cellar against the massive howling wind and tumbled my girls inside. A moment later, I too was inside and the door was secure. We lay huddled in the darkness as the roar wind grew louder and the banshee seemed to howl over our heads. The clattering and thundering and whining of the tornado made my ears ring. I clutched my family in my arms and my house was torn right away above me. Above the wails of my infant daughter and the shriek of the wind, I heard music. After a moment, I realized the storm was pumping the pedals of my wife's player organ, which is playing Amazing Grace, a song attached to the rollers, as it was being swept out of our front parlor and away. It felt as though we were there for hours waiting for the storm to pass, but it was probably only minutes. When all was calm, I forced open the door of the root cellar and climbed down into the darkness. We fled so fast that I had no flashlight with me. The moon was peeking out from the swirling clouds, and in its light I saw the bare ground where my house had stood. Well, not quite bare. There, standing alone in the center of the clearing, was the cupboard where my wife kept her best china. Not a cup inside it had been chipped. Turning slowly, I saw that our barn, which lay several hundred yards away, was untouched. The player piano was lodged in a tree beside it. As I stared at my devastated home, I saw something come drifting down from far up in the sky. For a moment, it blotted the moon. Then it fell directly at my feet. And I saw it was the blanket from my daughter's cradle. I picked it up and turned in time to see my wife and baby emerge from the root cellar. Wordless, I handed my wife the blanket and slowly the three of us walked over to the shelter of the barn to rest for the remainder of the night. We'd lost our house, but not one cow or horse had been snatched from the barn or pasture. It's my wife who summed up what we were feeling. Thank God for Padre Simon, she said. He saved you twice, Pedro. And so he had. Okay. Question for the, for the stupid. Where the fuck is Wich Wichita Falls? Because apparently... It's not where I thought it was. Wichita Falls. It is in Texas. Well, now I just feel even dumber. <laughs> Thanks, book. Holy crap. Oh, okay. It's just a lot of emails. Sorry, hold on. I'm taking care of some shit. had two Texas books. Ah, here we go. Here's the second one. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> ah, this is the book with Taylor Bone in it. I don't know why I like that story so much. I think it's because of my own voice acting in it. Oh, here we go. This one is called Fiddling on the Devil's Backbone, which is probably the most Texan thing I've ever heard of. But I need to respond to Dad first. Jeez, he's really kicking my ass this game. He really do. Can I do anything? Fiddling on the Devil's Backbone. There are those who say that Johnny Gimble is the best Texas fiddle player alive today. But others talk about another Gimble fiddle 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 fucking heck. Brain. Brain. Why have you forsaken me, Brain? Let's try this shit again, yeah? There are those that say that Johnny Gimble's the best Texas fiddle player alive today. But others talk about Gimble fiddle What? But others talk about another Gimble fiddle player, young Adam. Adam lived around the turn of the century, but Adam died before he reached his 16th birthday. From the bite of a rattlesnake. But they say- Brains aren't relevant anyway. I mean, you right. But they say it was not the bite of a single snake that killed Adam, rather, it was the bite of over a hundred rattlesnakes. And this is how it happened. Young Gimble lived on the Devil's Backbone near Wimberley. On Saturday evenings, he'd play the fiddle in the old Gimble barn. Folks would come by the wagon load for miles just to hear, just to, wow, just to dance to his music. Sometimes he'd play that fiddle till the sun came up next morning. He'd have those people dancing all the while, as reel after reel he'd play. Why, they'd even... Why, they even say cripples would throw away their crutches and dance to the tunes of Gimble's bow. Well, one day a stranger rode into town dressed in black from head to toe. He carried with him the faint aroma of sulfur. He tied his horse, a black horse with flaming eyes to a post on the town square and entered that cafe. I'm looking for the gimbal boy, the stranger said. I'd like to hear him play. Yeah, you can catch him at the gimbal place tonight, an old timer said. He'll be playing at the barn. I'm Irish for no reason. And that night, as the hour grew late, the stranger stepped into the barn. He lingered in the shadows, speaking to no one, never taking his eyes off Gimbal. Everyone who neared him, intending to speak, saw the dark expression on his face, and quietly moved away. They all agreed he carried with him the faint aroma of sulfur. Next morning, over coffee at the cafe, the stranger scoffed. You folks are living in the boondocks and don't even know it. 
They had nothing but cactus and scrub brush out here in the hill country. You would know real music if you heard it. That's why you think the gimbal boy is so good. Why, back east we have musicians that play so sweet they'll charm the birds right out of the trees. The stranger had his back to the door so he couldn't see Gimble walk in the cafe and slip up behind him. Now Gimble was a slight young man, thin with wiry muscles. But pride burned deep in his eyes, burned deep in his heart. Without so much as a glance at Gimble, the stranger said, So, young man, you got this whole town believing you're the best fiddle player in the land. And maybe you are. But it's a tiny plot of land. Gimble was tight-lipped. He lifted his chin and dug his hands in his pockets. I bet you can't charm a rattlesnake with your music, the stranger said. I hear they're plentiful out in these worthless rocks you call hill country. What's well, worth it to you to find out, sir? By now, everything. By now, everyone in the cafe had turned to hear the conversation. Well, I see you have some spirit about you. I like that. A little proud, you seem to be, maybe too proud for your own good. All eyes went to Gimble to see how he'd answer the challenge. But Gimble said not a word. Ah, fine then, said the stranger. How about a hundred dollars? That's what it was to me. Gimble only nodded, whirled about, and then banged the wall with his palm as he left the cafe. Damn, he's got a little temper. That evening, Adam played with his usual fire and had the folks dancing with joy. But he left the dance long before usual. Left it to wander out among the limestone builders. Boulders. Limestone. Mmm. Mmm. He climbs to the tallest spot on the devil's backbone. He could see the whole valley stretching below. They shotgun by his side. He settled himself on a big flat rock and took his fiddle from his case. Gamble fiddled for going on an hour. They had those snakes poking their heads up out of cracks, slithering to the base of the boulder. He picked up a shotgun and commenced to firing. He didn't stop till he'd blown the heads off of ten of them. Then he picked up the biggest one, about seven feet long it was, Jesus. He tied it in a knot around the other snakes. Tossing the dead snakes over his shoulder, Gimble strode down the hill. But now it seemed like everyone in Wimberley had come up with some kind of excuse to crowd the square. And what a sight they saw. Here come Gimble strutting down the road, snakes slung over his shoulder and dripping a trail of rattlesnake blood behind him. He walked in the cafe, right to the table where the stranger was having his coffee. For the first time now, Gimble noticed a faint aroma of sulfur. He flopped them rattlesnakes on the table. You heard my music. Now you see the snakes. My memory serves me. You owe me a hundred dollars, sir. The stranger realized it was time to pay up, and so he did. Snapped five twenties on the table, walked out the door, and rode quietly and quickly out of town. No one ever saw him again. No one remembered his black outfit. No one remembered his black horse. No one remembered the faint aroma of sulfur that followed him. Next Saturday night, Adam Gimble played his fiddle like he'd never played before. He'd have that barn just rocking and reeling and rolling back and forth. People were mesmerized by the beauty of his fiddle plan, by the speed and dexterity. But by two in the morning, Adam sat on his boulder with a shotgun next to him, and as he played, dozens of snakes came out of the cracks. They coiled at the base of the boulder, and as he played, and rocked and swayed, the snakes moved with his rhythm. Then he picked up his shotgun and carelessly blew the heads off of a dozen of them. 
and he left them dying and drying in the morning sun. That's fucking mean. Well, Adam seemed to lose interest in barn dances after that. Oh, we'd play for the folks, and they still came, though not as many as before. They still danced, but by midnight they'd filter back to their horses and ride on off, taken. Talking about how the dances used to be. Talking about how Gimba would play often until the sun came up the next morning. But he wasn't doing that no more. By the time the sun came up, he'd be sitting on that boulder with a shotgun, popping the heads off rattlesnakes and leaving them there to die. One summer evening, the full moon saw Adam once again on his rock, scratching out a slow and eerie tune. In a short while, up from the cracks crawled the biggest snake he'd ever seen. Not even going to try to estimate how long and fat around the rattlesnake was. But I should mention this. From that snake arose the faint aroma of sulfur. As soon as Adam saw the snake come slithering out, he knew he'd reached the far edges of the den deep in the earth. Behind the leader, the snake came forth as slow to sure as what arises from the flooded rubber, river. Dozens then hundreds of rattlesnakes. As if they'd planned this ritual. As if they'd waited for the time they came. As if they sang their wicked rattle dance, but once in a lifetime they came. Some paused to shake their rattles, some paused to show their fangs. In strange dark circles they sat, slow and sure as death they came. A smile at Adam's face that night, he hungered for the pride. Right before him, beneath his feet, slid the largest snake mankind had ever seen. His fiddle turned into fire, his fingers smoked the frets. He rocked and laughed to see the snakes begin to wave. Faster he played and faster they waved. Adam stood on the boulder like he'd never done before. Rocking back and forth, he saw the snakes move as one, like the waves of the sea. They rolled with his fiddle, swayed with his sway, to the tune of his sweet Texas fiddle, to the faint aroma of sulfur. Adam felt the numbness in his fingers first, and then his legs, still supporting him, had lost all feeling. His arms fell limp, and his fiddle slipped down. He watched it slide off the boulder and disappear among the snakes. His eyelids drooped, mere shadows now. Snakes climbed the rock like smoke from a sulfur fire. Some paused to shake their rattles, some paused to show their fangs. But dozens came, slithering up his legs, wrapping around his chest. When Adam stretched his arms apart, they grew like jungle vines to the tips of his fingers. When he laughed his final laugh, the tiniest of the rattlers slid between his teeth. Next day, they found young Adam Gimble lying on his back in the noonday sun. His body was swollen, purple, and bloated from the hundreds of rattlesnake bites. Around him hung the faint aroma of sulfur. Some Saturday evenings, when the full moon shines on Devil's backbone, you can still hear his music. When the wind blows through those old live oaks and scrubby cedars, you can hear it snippets of a country fiddle tune may make you rock and may make you sway but if your eyes begin to droop if you catch that faint aroma of sulfur I advise you to leave you never know what might slither up from the cracks of devil's backbone Guess this guy wasn't as badass as the banjo wielders, huh, Chaos? Well then. <laughs> yeah, that took a turn. Alright, remind me to enlist the banjo players, not the fiddlers. I mean, he, to be fair, he shouldn't have been murdering the rattlesnakes. They were just, they were just vibing. Mm-hmm. 
They were just vibing. What should we read next? I don't know, I think I'd rather die than sound of, to the sound of a fiddle than a banjo. Oh, I mean, yeah. Like, a fiddle is very pleasant to listen to, but if we're talking about being afraid of sounds in the night, I think you'd sooner run from a banjo than you would a fiddle. A banjo is somehow more intimidating. Cellos are OP. If you hear a cello in the night time, it's already over. <laughs> it's already done. Just you know, put your affairs in order best you can. Uh, let's see. I don't recall asking for your opinion, Reddit, but I guess I'll make sure things are not going to shit. Oh, sweet. Okay, the world does not completely fall apart yet. Sorry, I... No impulse control at all. Uh, let's go to China. Let's see. There's an old woman that was transformed into a wolf. Let's see. Okay. This one is called The Old Woman Who Was Transformed Into a Wolf from the book called Censored by Confucius. In Ijo con I really wish I could speak. That'd be great. I mean that's not really spooky, is it? I didn't ask for your music. Hush. In Aizhou County, Guangdong Province, there was a peasant by the name of Sun, whose mother had lived well into her seventies. One day, completely out of the blue, she started to grow hair on her arms. The hair spread to her back and then to her stomach and hands. Eventually, she was entirely covered by inch-long hair. It was then that her body began to shrivel, and a tail began to grow from her buttocks. Soon after the tail had formed, she'd collapsed to the ground. 
and before everyone's eyes, she was transformed into a white-haired wolf. The wolf dashed out of the house and was gone. There was nothing that startled... There was nothing the startled Swin family could do but to wait to see if she would return. As it turned out, the wolf returned regularly, once every three or four weeks. She would check on her sons and grandchildren, and would usually have a meal and drink before leaving again. The neighbors were disgusted by this unnatural creature, and threatened to kill her, or at least drive her away from the village. Her son and his wife were terrified that something would indeed befall their mother if she continued to visit, so they resolved to warn her against returning. They prepared a banquet with delicacies such as pig trotters, and when the wolf had returned, her son explained that the feast was in her honor. Mother, after this feast is over, you must never come home again. We know that you think of us while you're out in the woods, and we know that you would never do any harm to anyone. But the neighbors are fearful. They are planning to kill you and have their weapons ready at this very moment. We would never be able to live with ourselves if you were killed paying us a visit. So please, stay away and keep yourself safe. On hearing their advice, the wolf howled mournfully, but then, after one last look at her loved ones, she ran off into the forest, and was never seen again. Well, that's just sad. Alright, let's try the next one. A loyal dog makes use of another dog's body. Oh boy. An exceptionally handsome young Beijing man named Chang had a dog by the name of Flower on whom he doted. Chang and Flower were inseparable. Wherever Chang went, Flower could be seen scampering along behind. One fine spring day, they went to Feng Tai to visit the park's famous blossoms. By the time they began their homeward journey, it was late, and there were very few people around. Unfortunately, as Chong and Flower made their way through the empty grounds, they happened to pass three noisy hooligans, stretched out on the grass, drinking. Now these three young drunks decided to have some fun with the handsome young man, and they began yelling all sorts of obscene prepositions. I just skimmed ahead a little bit, just to make sure I knew where this was going. When the drunks received no response, they switched to more direct tactics. They jumped at Chong and started kissing him and pulling his clothes off. Young Chong was absolutely mortified, both embarrassed and terrified at this assault. He tried to struggle free, but he wasn't very strong and was clearly outnumbered. Seeing her master in strife, Flower growled and rushed in to bite the attackers. One of the young hooligans turned his attention to Flower, stoning the dog and eventually smashing her skull. So Flower sank to the ground nearby a tree, dead. Having rid themselves of this nuisance, the three hooligans set upon Jong Chong with greater seriousness of purpose. They bound his arms and his legs with his belt pulled his trousers down to his knees, and pushed him face down to the ground. Okay. And then there's an attempt at assault of a certain particularly vile nature. Suddenly, out of the bushes rushed a mangy dog. He bit the rapist right on the testicles, and with a quick twist of his neck ripped them off. Then, dropping the bleeding sacks to the ground, the dog escaped back into the bushes. 
Blood gushed from the wounded man's groin, and his friends, in terror lest the dog return, carried, his, carried him home. Eventually, the passers-by saw Chong tied up on the ground. They undid the belt, helped him dress himself, and saw him on his way home. In the quiet of his own residence, Chong felt the loss of his royal dog more keenly than before. He vowed to return the next day to retrieve Flower's body so as to give her a proper burial. That night he dreamed that Flower spoke to him. You have always been so kind to me. I was robbed of my chance to repay this kindness when that villain killed me. But even though I was physically dead, my soul was very much alive. I attached myself to the body of that mangy dog that lives at the bean curd store and was able to kill that rapist all that same. Now, even though I am dead, I can rest in peace knowing that I have served you well. The flower then whimpered pitifully before disappearing. The next day, Chong went to the bean curd store to see if there really was such a mangy dog. The dog indeed did exist, and when Chong asked the owner about it, he was told, this dog is really sick, old, and quite incapable of biting anyone. But you know, last night he came home with his mouth dripping with blood. I'm still not sure what happened. Chong then sent some friends to ask about the recent deaths in the locality. And sure enough, the young hooligan had died of his wounds the previous night, soon after returning home. God damn. These stories are a lot more metal than the other book. Whoa. God damn. Well, this book kind of just goes straight for it, huh? There's a whole section on homosexuality in this book? What? If I had known that, I would have picked more carefully. Well, that was something. All right. I'll do one or two more. I'm deciding from where.
Ah, there we go. So this is from True Ghost Stories, the first responders. This one, because this might strike a nerve. Not for me, but for someone else. Alright, here we go. This one is simply titled Giggles. <sighs> Every officer, if they do this job long enough, has one or two calls they respond to that change the way they look at the world. This thing is not on the charger? Well, fuck me. Oh, I feel dumb. Move my legs a little. There we go. Oh, that's a little better. <sighs> Jeez, I'm already tired. I've only been doing this an hour. It's only nine. God, I'm not really putting on a great show for everybody today, I'm sorry. Well, I'm doing my best, and I'm sure that matters. <sighs> Every officer, if they do this job long enough, has one or two calls they respond to. The chain- I'm still Southern. Ugh. <sighs> Shit, dog. Alright. Uh, every officer, if they do this job long enough, has one or two calls that respond to. It changes the way they look at the world. Most of the time, it comes about when you don't really expect it. When you're called to a murder scene, you know what's waiting for you. The only question is how bad is it going to be when you get there? It is the times when you least expect something bad's going to happen. And it's a thousand times worse that messes with you. Oh god, I'm still southern. What the fuck? Come on, man. Ugh. It's the times when you least suspect something bad's gonna... What the fuck is the sentence? It is the times when you least suspect something bad to happen. And it's a thousand times worse that messes with you. That's yeah, interesting sentence structure. My partner, Officer Maddox, and I was called to respond to a possible domestic situation one night, and I still have nightmares about it to this day. So far that day, we'd only been involved in a few minor traffic stops, nothing ordinary, <laughs> nothing out of the ordinary. It was getting a little late, and we were discussing what we wanted to grab for dinner that night when a call came over the radio. Someone had called in a complaint about a man screaming loudly in his house. The neighbors had heard him and were concerned for his safety, figuring it was possibly a dispute between the guy and maybe his wife or girlfriend. The radio thought he'd be responding to the call. In these types of situations, it can get pretty ugly because the emotions are already at a breaking point and violence can be a definite possibility. Pulling up to the front curb, we already had a bad feeling about the place. The place was obviously the worst kept place on the block. The lawn wasn't cut, there was garbage strewn about the front, and it appeared that there were multiple days of mail and papers yet to be picked up. The place was an eyesore on an otherwise nice suburban street. If 
fact that anyone would have bothered to be concerned about whoever lived now is a bit of a surprise. Walking up to the front door, I could already detect the smell coming inside the house that seeped through the open window. I smelled the sweat and cigarettes. I knew after I left this place I was going to want to grab a shower, otherwise I'd carry the smell with me all night. The idea of going out to eat after this, uh, that ruined my appetite. I reach my hand out and knock on the door. I can hear footsteps inside the residence, and without opening the door, I hear a man's voice. Who is it? What do you want? The voice is hoarse, almost like a loud whisper. Sir, this is the police. Your neighbor called us after hearing you screaming. Uh, we're here to make sure you're okay. For a moment, all we can hear is stirring from the other side the door, and someone has the police show up at the door unexpectedly, we know people's first reaction isn't to welcome us in with open arms. The best thing we've learned to do is wait them out. Then on the other side of the door breaks the silence first. I'm fine, just go away. My partner tries his luck to see if he can get the guy to open the door. Uh, can you open the door just to see if we're okay? Again, a brief moment of silence follows before he speaks. Fine. But then you have to go. I hear the sound of locks disengaging, at least three. Then the door swings open just wide enough to expose the man's face and part of his body. His hair is gray. Oh, from what I can tell, greasy. From not being washed. His clothes ain't any better. Covered in either sweat, stains, or you know, some other substance. Now that the door is open, the smell gushes out and smacks me in the face. It takes everything I have not to even take a single step backward. As much as I wanted to leave it at that, I had a job to do. So, can we come in and make sure that no one in here needs our help? The man begins to mumble under his breath. I can't quite make out what he's saying, but. He seems to be having a one-sided conversation with himself, trying to decide whether to let us in or not. Well, that's not a good sign. Finally, it seems that he makes the decision to let us in, and with a grumble, the door opens, giving a sentry. Walking in, I look around, and I see that there's paper, debris, and rotting food all over the place. Ashtrays are flowing with cigarette butts everywhere. That explains the smell. I just want to get the search done and over with so I can get out of there. The idea that this guy can even stand to live here baffles me. I just want to burn the place to the ground, contents and all, and start over. Splitting up being off of somatics make quick work of the room-to-room -room search. Other than more disgusting rooms, we don't really find any evidence of another person being there. I don't really feel comfortable leaving without at least getting some information from the guy, so I decided to do my best to ignore the smell and ask a few questions. Sir, so, was it your screaming that your neighbors heard a little while ago, or was there someone else here? He starts looking back and forth in the room, almost like he's trying to see if someone else is there. Then he starts to speak, but doesn't feel like he's talking to us anymore, but rather himself. Always someone there. Always watching. Always following. Never alone. The guy just took a hard right into crazy though. So who's with you? Are they here now? His voice comes out as a whisper. Always here. I know that I can't just leave this guy here. He's obviously a danger to himself. I have the ability to put a 24-hour hold on him in a psychiatric unit if we feel it's necessary. In this case, I think it is. I reach up and hit the button on the radio to inform dispatch that we're going to be taking this man from home for evaluation. Uh, sir, we're going to need you to come with us, okay? I try and make my voice as soothing and understanding as I can. I reach out to take his arm, and suddenly he's yanked back from behind. It looks like someone has a hold of his hair, yet I can't see anyone there. He screams out in pain, and is thrown to the floor in a heap. 
I don't know what I'm seeing right now. First, I think he's trying to do whatever he can to keep from being taken. I've seen some people do some crazy shit not to go to jail. This one's right up there with the worst of them. He begins to look down at his chest and rip at his shirt. It doesn't take much for the stained piece worn cloth to give way. I see four long scratches on his chest. In places they're trickling with blood. If they had been there before, we'd have noticed the red stains on his shirt. These just happened as we stood there. His head's violently ripped back again and again by some unknown force. All I could do for a moment is stand there in shock as I witnessed this going on only a few feet in front of me. I've been trained to deal with a lot of things, but this isn't something I've ever seen before. I'm convinced this is some sort of violent manic episode, but I don't know how the scratches got on his chest. Officer Maddox is the first to jump into action. He lunges forward and grabs the man under both his arms and drags him to the house. As soon as he gets out the door, whatever's happening to him seems to stop immediately. He looks around the yard, almost like he's unsure where he is or how long he got there. I help my partner pick him up and we both walk him back to the cruiser. For safety, we decide to handcuff him just in case he starts flailing about again. But really, we don't really have much of a choice after what we just saw. Finally, with him secure in the back of the car, we climb in and radio to the hospital. We've got someone coming in for evaluation. Behind us, the man starts to talk again. Though his voice has lost its raspy tone, and now he's taken on a high-pitched, strange, almost childlike quality. It appears like he's talking to somebody, but he's the only one back there. Both me and Maddox are creeped out when he starts to giggle whatever his twisted mind is telling him. To drown out the noise, we turn on the music and start to drive away. The giggling hits a crescendo, forcing me to look back and see what could possibly be so funny. Out of nowhere, a small bird slams headfirst right into the windshield of the car. My head swings back around in time to see my partner, who's incredibly startled by what just happened, swerve nearly into oncoming traffic. The impact has left a small crack in the glass, and where the bird hit it, you can see a small, bloody splotch. Did you see that? It flew right at us, Maddox said. I turn back and look at the man in the back seat. He has on his face a satisfied grin. A knowing grin. We dropped the man off at the hospital a few minutes later without any further incidents. That day is the day I'm sure Officer Maddox and I came into contact with something far worse than some crazed guy holed up in his house. It took me a while to accept what we'd seen that day. Something was there in that house with him. And that something didn't stay there when we left. It was in the car and it killed that bird. The memory of that day will be with me forever. Oof. Could be. I don't know. The timing of everything is pretty weird. But the giggling and the childlike voice definitely seems reminiscent of some sort of, like. I mean. If Ren were different than Ren. Huh, okay. I'm assuming it's fine. I think I've got one more in me. Anyone have any requests? 
I mean, I might do something like inscription or something. I have a lot less energy than I thought I had. Short Poe? You got it. What's short? Uh, if such a thing exists. <laughs> All right. Let's do... Oh, fuck me. I forgot I have a book completely full of dust I execute to, like, the left of me. Alright, either way. I believe the Mask of the Red Death is pretty quick. I also don't remember very well. The Mask of the Red Death. The Red Death has long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution, then scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, with a pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. The whole time siege- oh, fuck me, I can't read. I cannot read. Ugh. Let's try this shit again. Red death is long as long as I'm trying to seal the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero is a happy and dauntless and sagacious man. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence the thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of his castellated abbeys. It was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own centric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. The walls had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and wielded the bolts. Sorry, and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, 
there is beauty, and there is wine. All of these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first let me tell you of the rooms in which it held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many places, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is barely impeded. Here the case was very different, as it might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. His apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and each turn had a novel effect. To the right and left in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now, in no one of these seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum, amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro, or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from the lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood opposite of each window a heavy tripod, bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass so glaringly, and so glaringly illuminated the room. And thus, it produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered, that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. T'was in this apartment also, that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony, its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance, to hearken to the sound, and thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief 
disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused revelry or meditation. When the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled at their own nervousness and folly and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock. And then, with the same discomfort and tremulousness in meditation as before. But, in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great feat and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. Much of what has been seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures which, with unsuited limbs and appointments, there were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, much of those, and something of the terrible, and not a little that would have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhed in and out taking hue from rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then for a moment all is still, and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant. And a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many-tinted windows through which stream and rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly, the seven, there were now none of the maskers who venture. The night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls. And to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. As the revel went whirlingly on into length, there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted. And there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. 
But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened. Perhaps that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus too it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise. And then, finally, of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such a sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had outherited Herod, and had gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the heart of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel in that costume and bearing of the stranger. Neither wit nor propriety existed figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to toe in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse, that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the murmur had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, with which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more, f as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste. But then, in the next. His brow reddened with rage. Who dares? He demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. Twas in the eastern or blue chamber which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the Prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first he spoke. There was a slight rushing of movement of this group in the direction of the intruder who at the moment was so near at hand, and now with deliberate and stately step made closer approach to the speaker. But from certain nameless awe, with which
but from the literary, but from certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the murmur had inspired the whole party. There were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, and the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even threats to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached, in rapid and Tuosity, to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming on the sable carpet, upon, in upon which, instantly afterward, fell prostrate in death. The Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and, seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror, finding the grave's cerement and the corpse like mask, which they had handled with so violent a rudeness untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died, each in the despairing posture of his fall. In the life of the ebony clock, went out with the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and red death held illimitable dominion over all. Okay, to be fair, I think that's the shortest of anything I've, I've read of, um, You'll take it? Hell yeah. I'll read more next week. I'll... I should feel better by then. What the fuck? There's something called diddling in here? This is why you don't read the table of contents.
That can't mean what I think it means. To, like to to swindle someone okay I hmm I'm a I'm a fact check that why well, you should read the table of contents you know what fair definition Diddle. Oh, wow. To cheat or swindle. Oh, I was completely wrong about what I thought that meant, then. Pastime aimlessly or unproductively. Okay, that's a lot more innocent than I thought. Player mess with. Oh, vulgar slang North American to have sex with. Yeah, okay, there we go. There we go. I I thought it was like uh, I thought it was much more sinister than any of those. Okay. I I know now not to fear that. But I know now to fear anything with illegal homosexuality in that one book cuz apparently that shit's not that's not good. I mean, I should clarify I'm obviously pro-LGBT. Um, anyone who knows me well knows that, but... Uh, historically, I expected people not to agree with that particular thing. Alright. Let's do one more Chinese one for the road. We'll do... We'll do the one called Bird. Never mind, it's long as hell. Stir fry. This is from Strange Tales from his Chinese studio. A certain scholar was staying in the provincial capital for the examinations and returned to his lodgings as night was falling. He had brought back with him some lotus seeds and pieces of lotus root, which he placed on the desk in his room. That can't mean what I think it means. That can't mean what I think it means. Nope. Hold on. I am learning a lot more than I bargained for today with a lot more might all than should still be in my system for such tasks. How do you spell definition? Definition. An object shaped, okay, yeah. Uh, really? Hold on, I need to read this in the entirety before I decide to read this.
会。Oh my god, it is exactly what I think it is. Alright. This is so funny that I think I'm just gonna tell it anyway. I'm not sure why this is considered a supernatural story, but it's the last one in the book, so hey. A certain scholar was staying in the provincial capital for the examinations, and returned to his lodgings as night was falling. He brought back with him some lotus seeds and a piece of lotus root, which he placed on the desk in his room. He also took out a dildo he had acquired, and this is the word I googled, dildo, because I was just like, no, but actually, yes, there is no other definition for that word that I can find. So he also took out a dildo he had acquired, made of rattan, or rattan, R-A-T-T-A-N, and put it to soak in a bowl of water. Why did he do this? I'm not entirely sure. At that very moment, his neighbors, hearing that he was back, came round with wine to spend the evening carousing with him, and he quickly hid the bowl under the bed and tarried out to greet them, instructing his wife to prepare some food. After the meal, he went back to his room and shone a lamp under the bed, only to discover that the bowl was empty. He asked his wife what had happened to the contents of the bowl, and she replied, Oh, that. I cooked it just now for our guests. To go with a lotus root. Why, were you keeping it for something? When she said this, he recalled a dish that had been set before them on the table with something black all chopped up in it which none of them had been able to recognize. He laughed. You foolish woman! How could you think of serving such a thing to our guests? I was wondering why you never gave me the recipe for it, replied his perplexed wife. It was such a nasty-looking thing. I had no idea what it was. All I could think of doing was chopping it up into little pieces and stir-frying it. So... She chopped up and stir-fried the sex toy. He proceeded to tell her what the nasty-looking thing really was, and the two of them had a good laugh about it. The man went on to become a man of rank. His good friends still joke about it with him to this very day. And that's the whole story. I... I don't know why it's in here. I don't know what it's doing. I... I don't... I... you know what? I feel like that's a good place to end. <laughs> I, I don't know why that's in this book. I don't know why. But, but there you go. We will return to sanity, at least until next week, when I will read more spooky stories. These are going back to Friday. 
I'm doing this on a Saturday because I took so much medication yesterday that I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, it was 9.30. And I was just like, we're not starting this at 9.30. That's definitely different. Yeah, it's different than anything I've read in this book so far. If you want to fact check me, the, the book is called Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling. You can completely find it for free on the internet. I, whether or not it's legal, I will leave up to you. I personally got it completely, totally legally. Of course. Because I am a perfect law-abiding citizen. Um. Yup. But that's in there. I did not make that up. That is now a Google search that I have made. It did say strange, not supernatural, so I guess it's not wrong. Like... It's, you see, it's interesting, right? Because most of these stories deal with the supernatural. But I guess he just threw in weird shit, too. I mean, unless... I don't know. I really think it's just that. <laughs> Hello, Kaney. You came in right at the end. I'm about to end the stream. Uh, but... You definitely might want to peep the VOD. But in the meantime... I'm gonna get some rest. My body is kind of starting to fall apart again. And I, I need a, I need a rest. But thank y'all for hanging out. Hopefully you enjoyed it, even though I am made of, I am made of garbage. In the meantime, though, do not eat or drink any questionable substances. Make smart decisions. Do not die. Dying is absolutely forbidden, and I will see all. Of you wonderful people at a later time. Take care, guys. Thank you.